We've seen how all the sand and gravel that makes up the north of the Isle of Man was left by the retreating ice which finally melted around 18,000 years ago. And since then the wind, the rain and the sea have all done their best to try and remove this material. And now in the 21st century land and property is being threatened like never before. And it's the sea that's doing more than anything else to change this northern part of the island. And we can measure the destruction year by year. After the ice retreated, there was probably much more land here than there is now. The coast could have been up to four kilometres further out, even as recently as 5,000 years ago. The sea is an unpredictable and relentless force, and year after year it has been eating away at the base of these cliffs, washing the sand and clay away and causing the tops to slump down. You can easily see the results of this slumping. Fences hang in the air, and field drainage pipes discharge their water onto the sand below. Areas of grass are also visible. These were once the surface of the fields, now sliding down to the sea. Obviously this is having a dramatic effect on the people who live around here. Not only is valuable farmland being lost, thousands of metres have been lost to the sea already, but property is also threatened. Who knows how many buildings have fallen into the sea in the past centuries? We know of some farms, cottages, a church and a mill in the past two centuries, and there are some that are actually threatened today. This is Carlin Mill, now a private house, but the main part of the building was built as a mill some 500 years ago. At that time it would have been a safe distance from the sea. The little stream nearby provided water to turn the miller's wheel, but things are very different now. Just over 10 years ago at the front of the house there was a lovely long garden. But then, in one viciously stormy night, the sea ripped vast amounts of land from along this coast, and over the following weeks, the owner had to watch his garden gradually disappear. Since then, it's been a fight to save the property. The owner of Carlin Mill is David Greenwood, and he recalls that fateful storm. We had two storms. One was the 25th of January, and the second one the 26th of February. 1990. Uh, the 26th of February, uh, we're having breakfast one morning, 8 o'clock, weather forecast, and as you know, they give the rough to very rough, so on, and this morning it was very high to phenomenal. Never heard it before, never heard it since. I just said to one, what the hell's coming today? And we just moved the furniture back, waited for it, and it whipped in, from, you know, we are still here, but we've done a lot of work you know, since those days. How much garden did you actually lose here? We had to move out of the house. Uh, we lost something like 30 yards of land in a month. It didn't all go in one night, but it, near enough 30 days we more or less lost it. 30 yards is a lot, we've only left with 22 now. Behind me you'll see the rocks out at sea and towards the end of those rocks that was near enough our land. That's yeah. where your garden used to near, stretch? Near them. enough, yeah, within a few feet. The other point is that when we had the 52 yards of land you, you could walk to the edge and you could actually just crouch down and jump off onto the beach which was seven, eight feet maybe. Yeah. Uh, you can see now behind me and what's happened is the actual beach level has gone down several feet. Uh, I've had the government people up and they came here and realised that the beach levels are actually going down. So you can see behind me, you wouldn't jump down now onto the beach. Uh, but that's, that's how it was, about seven, eight feet we could jump onto the beach. What do you think the government should do about protecting the coastal area of this northern plain? That's a difficult one, isn't it? <laughs> what we think they should do and what they actually do. I, I honestly think we're just left on our own. But well, you've had to pay for all of this defensive work yourself. We pay for everything, yeah. 
Today, Mr. Greenwood's house stands surrounded by his fortifications, putting a defiant face to the sea. But who knows how long they will last. Another property nearby that is threatened is Balatir. It's a small farm on the top up there. And here too, the owner has taken things into his own hands. He's placed gabions along the base of the cliff to protect it. And they've been completely wrecked by the sea. Gabions are giant wire baskets filled with stones. And they've recently been used on the mountain road to protect it from landslips. They are usually a strong and effective way of stabilising land. That is until the sea gets to them. Here they've been tossed around like so many pebbles. The sea will not be defied. Worse still, they have an effect on the sea currents, causing swirling eddies in the water, which have an even worse effect on the erosion. Aerial photography taken two years ago shows that the gabions were in relatively good condition and they seem to be offering some protection to Balatir on the cliff above. But the storms of the last two years have wreaked havoc on the baskets and who knows how long they'll last. But it's not only the sea that is causing erosion around here. All the way down this coast, there are great cuts in the cliffs where rivers join the sea. Over thousands of years, they have been eroding their way through the sand cliffs, carrying away material and dumping it on the beaches. Rather than threatening landowners, some people have taken advantage of this. The garden of this house just south of Kirk Michael is particularly flat and that's because it used to be a riverbed formed thousands of years ago. Now since then the river's taken a different course and we can see it from round the back here. This garden is what's known as a river terrace. That is, a level which the river settled at for a while before something made it change its course and it began to erode into the land over there. From above you can see the huge valley the river eventually cut and on the left the house with the flat garden where the river once flowed but it's the sea that's still having the most dramatic effect on the coast. And just north of here, a whole village is threatened. Is it now time for the government to get involved? Kirk Michael is finding itself just that bit closer to the beach every year. And there's obvious concern that someday soon, the very houses and streets of the village will be threatened. But what action can be taken to stop the sea? And how much would it cost? There are already some attempts to stop the sea eroding the coast here using blocks of granite, but they can't save the village. Well, when in doubt, call the consultants. And that's just what the Manx government did in 2000, when they engaged consulting engineers Posforth de Vivier and asked them to come and look at the whole problem of coastal erosion and report back with some recommendations. And the man who commissioned that report, the then Minister for Transport, the Honourable Tony Brown MHK, is waiting just up here to talk to us. Mr Brown is now the Speaker of the House of Keys, but it was his recommendations in the Timwell debate that helped formulate government policy on coastal erosion. And given the consultants identified a number of houses that will fall into the sea within the next 12 years, wasn't some urgent action needed? Well, no, I mean, we looked at the situation and said, really, for those properties, there's very little could be done without considerable uh, expense. And uh, what, in fact, happened was the report that Tinwald received and adopted was, in fact, that we should try and manage the situation. 
As a caring government, do you not think that the government should compensate landowners for their property which is being lost to the sea? Well, government's always taken the view that that was not their role. And in fact, it's not unique to the Isle of Man. That's a, that's a view generally held throughout Europe. Um, the situation is that either people have either lived there for generations and the erosion's gone on for hundreds of years, it's nothing new, or they've built there in recent times, uh, knowing that in fact they're building in an area where there is potential erosion. So I think we have to balance all that up and take a view, a, a realistic view really, as to what is the responsibility of government on land it doesn't own, uh, in an area where in fact the only responsibility to have is in relation to the high, wa high water mark and the low water mark. So when you look into all the pros and cons, the only thing we can try and do is say no more development must go past a certain line. And that's been in the uh, Kirk Michael local plan now for quite a number of years. So development of housing or of any property can't happen past a certain line. The report states that Kirk Michael will be under threat in approximately 150 years. Are you not being complacent in just allowing future generations to sort out the problem? Now, I think timing is important and I think whether we like it or not, future generations are going to have to consider what to do about this. In, in the report that we did and we had uh, consultants providing the information for us, expert in this field, um, they actually looked and said yes we could build a retention wall where we are today um, but in 25-30 years time the sea will have eroded around the edges of that and start to then erode the land behind the wall you'd have to do major works um, to keep the wall into reasonably good order because we're talking about a sort of a, a rock wall face. Um, and of course the problem then is that we would have to then totally rebuild that wall uh, after a period of more years. So the view is taken that in fact if you're going to do anything to protect the village, and I suspect in, in years to come that will be the important question, it's when you do it. And if you're going to build such a retention wall, that timing is very important. So yes, it may well be in a hundred years time that the generations of that time have to make that decision. What we're saying at the moment is we should do what we can to manage uh, and if like try and slow down the erosion as best we can by using other means. And the way to manage it was in fact to look at uh, proper drainage, uh, stopping agricultural works uh, carrying on right up to the edge of the uh, cliff face. Uh, possibly some planting of special shrubs and grass that would actually help hold the area together. Um, I mean it is a difficult situation because of course this cliff face in this area is actually uh, sand based so it's really quite erosive. Do you think at the end of the day you can stop the erosion? No, I don't think that man can really uh, quite easily stop uh, the sea. The force of the sea is uh, very very powerful and if the land all the way into the village is of the same nature then the erosion will continue as it has done for the last two or three hundred years. We are now some way back to where uh, the coastland used to be and of course we know many properties have over the years fallen into the sea so nothing is unfortunately going to change but what we can do is maybe look to manage it and make a concerted effort at an appropriate time which may uh, safeguard the village. It might be possible to try and protect this area of coast below Kirkmichael by building a huge rock armour wall, rather like the breakwater in Douglas with its concrete stabits that help absorb and deflect the power of the waves. But not only would it look horrible along this coast and cost millions of pounds, there's also another problem. We've already seen at the Gabians further up the coast how the sea can get in behind these structures and such a wall, which would have to end somewhere, might actually make matters worse. The armour would merely deflect the energy of the waves elsewhere along the coast. The existing rock armour, giant granite blocks from Foxdale, does protect the land above it, but it leaves the bits in between very exposed. The fish farm here at Glenwillan is now teetering on the edge, and the land on either side of the armour is eroding as fast as ever, leaving the protected parts standing proud like promontories. It's interesting to note though that wherever there is armour, the cliffs directly above are sprouting vegetation, which is helping to stabilise and consolidate them. So the armour does work, it's just the expense and the uncertain effect elsewhere on the coast that's the problem. But whilst all the discussions take place and Tim Wall debates the issues and the consultants make recommendations, well, the sea waits for no one. It's busy moving the beach.